Hello Penguin or Sign the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. This episode we are continuing our construction of our grand mission to Reaper. So what we're launching here on our trusty Albatross 15 which uh, have now slightly updated the designs so that the second stage doesn't burn up on re-entry. Uh, made sure that we actually have fuel to uh, do a little re-entry burn slash boost back burn to reduce our velocity before we slam into the atmosphere and melt all the engines. So this time we are launching the fuel module because yeah we need a lot of fuel to get all the way out to Reaper and we're building a pretty hefty spacecraft. We've got three separate landers, well two landers uh, and a single cargo SSTO which itself contains a hybrid rover submarine thing. Uh, we also need to have of course all of the habitation modules and the like in that giant hab ring so yeah we're going to need a lot of fuel. Even though we have made a lot of progress since our previous generation of interplanetary spacecraft and we now have much more powerful nuclear engines which we will be of course slapping onto our propulsion module a little bit later in the episode. Now we had a little bit of a problem with this module here because the weight limit of the Albatross 15 is 200 tons. However, this fuel module weighs about 220. I thought I could just about manage it, um, but we end up having a little bit of a problem. You see, I, I packed a lot of monopropellant on uh, this fuel module as well, which is what whacked it over the uh, weight threshold in the end, uh, mainly because we almost ran out of monopropellant on our previous interplanetary missions. I always seem to underestimate quite how much monopropellant you need, and considering how big this <laughs> spacecraft is, I really don't want to run out. Of course, we can refuel the monopropellant when we're out there. We're planning to uh, use our Valm lander to refuel all our liquid fuel. We can also refuel uh, with monopropellant as well, but I don't really want to risk running out of monopropellant at any point during this mission because then we won't be able to turn the spacecraft and that will be a bit of a problem considering how massive it is. But you can see here we're just doing our, uh, just approaching our circularization and we've pushed our apoapsis all the way up to 100 kilometers, giving us plenty of time to do this burn. Slight problem is, yeah, we don't quite have enough delta V to do it. Now that fuel reading in the bottom left, I was going off of that and I thought, oh, we've got loads of fuel left, not quite realizing that uh, I accidentally had fuel cross feed still enabled. Uh, so it's showing how much liquid fuel we have. Uh, but of course, the fuel in this tank uh, is only liquid fuel. There is no oxidizer since we're using it to power nuclear engines which don't need oxidizers. So we can't drain a little bit of the fuel just to push us into orbit. So what we need to do is use the monopropellant and uh, use those RCS thrusters just to give us that extra kick into orbit. So cutting back to that first stage there, as you uh, saw in the last episode, now we have these cool landing legs and grid fins. I keep trying to uh, get these first stages as close as possible to the launch pad. Last time we got within a kilometer, which was pretty cool. This time we're a little bit further south, um, mainly because I, I messed up reading the nav ball. So I tried to burn a little bit further north and ended up burning further south. So yeah, we're landing a little way away. Obviously we're still getting some like 98% of the funds back since we're landing very close, although we are landing on a mountain. So thank God for the, uh, the landing legs. If we didn't have those, we would have ended up tumbling down. Uh, and probably breaking the stage. You can see here we actually, yes, have fuel this time. Last time I forgot to disable flow from that bottom tank, so we had no fuel for a re-entry burn, and as such, we burned up on re-entry. This time we have enough fuel to slow down, and then just save a little bit more just to make sure our parachutes can deploy, uh, just reducing that velocity. I probably should slap some drogue chutes on this uh, second stage here, because the parachutes always seem to deploy a little bit too late for my liking, so yeah, I think we should slap some drogue chutes on there just to slow the velocity um, a little bit before the deployment of those main chutes. You can see here though, now we don't have a third stage, we're having to do all our manoeuvring with monopropellant. We ended up using something like a quarter of the monopropellant on this fuel tank, which is not ideal, uh, and we actually slapped a bunch of extra monopropellant on one of our later launches to actually refill the tanks on this, because yeah, uh, we probably should have just... Uh, launched with maybe one of these monopropellant tanks empty um, and then you know brought up some more monopropellant uh, on one of the later launches where we had some uh, spare payload capacity you know but yeah whatever hindsight is a wonderful thing I thought we could just about stretch it to uh, 220 tons but no 200 tons really is it's the limit of the 
<laughs> of the Albatross. Although I'm, I'm really starting to like that launch system. Um, it's very, very powerful, and it really is cost-effective with, uh, with it being almost fully reusable. The third stage isn't. It could be fully reusable. I'm just lazy, and the third stage only costs something like 30,000 funds. Um, so the effort I would have to go to to reuse it, I really just can't be bothered, especially considering that uh, money really isn't a problem for us ever since we've established Artemis, our, our moon colony, and started shipping back very rare resources from there. But there you go, we can see we have our fuel module now. And so now it is time to launch the propulsion module, but before we do, what we're doing is we're transmitting back some of the science generated on those research labs on Morningstar. Yes, that's why we actually slap those... Uh, research labs uh, on there and fill them up with data from our previous interplanetary missions actually got them uh, going and didn't freeze our crew immediately it's because I wanted to generate enough science so that we could research an upgrade to those big nuclear engines uh, which is what we have now because uh, we were one tech node away and I thought there's very little point in launching this mission and have you know the first tech that we research with the science from this mission be an upgrade to the engines we're using so I just wanted to get just enough science that we could actually upgrade the, uh, the main engines. It's quite a significant upgrade as well. It's an, a pretty big increase, something like 25% uh, to, uh, to the thrust of the engines we're using, so it was certainly worth having. You can see here, it's uh, it's quite an interesting looking spacecraft. Um, I've cut out most of the launch since it's, a, well, it's an identical launch vehicle to, uh, to what you saw with the uh, fuel module. Although this time we haven't exceeded the payload capacity. But uh, yeah, although these nuclear engines require a lot of cooling, hence the huge amount of radiators and that massive um, <laughs> circular radiator here that's uh, doubling as a radiation shield for the crew members of Morningstar. Uh, these are seriously impressive engines and I'll get onto them in a minute once we're in orbit. You can see here I was uh, pretty proud of this one. We get really close. We didn't land quite on the launch pad but uh, at some point I'm hoping we do and we also don't have any problems landing the second stage as well. So now we're in orbit we just get rid of the third stage there. We didn't quite have enough fuel left in it to do our rendezvous so we're just using a little bit of fuel from the actual propulsion module itself and you can see these nuclear engines operating in all of their glory. Now the standard nuclear engines have an ISP, so that's efficiency, of 800 seconds. These have an ISP of 1,500 seconds, so almost twice the efficiency of our standard nuclear engines. And they also have a thrust, something like three or four times higher. So yeah, these are pretty damn awesome engines. Uh, as I said though, they do require a lot of fueling. Uh, fueling? Cooling! <laughs> well, I mean, they, they obviously require fuel as well. Uh, but yeah, they require a lot of cooling, hence the huge amount of radiators on this. I mean, using KOSP Interstellar is always just an exercise in radiator spam, but uh, that massive circular radiator certainly does uh, reduce the amount of uh, radiators we had to slap all over it. So uh, yeah, we, we probably have too much cooling there, uh, but I wanted to make sure we had too many radiators rather than uh, than not enough because I don't know how much uh, you know being this close to Archangel might overheat our systems so better to be safe than sorry so now we've actually finished Morningstar the main mothership itself all we need to do now is launch the final component of our mission and that is uh, well, it's actually a two-part thing we need to have some atmospheric probes to drop into Reaper um, Originally our probe mission to Reaper was supposed to drop a rover to the surface and then I realized that a single heat shield is nowhere near enough to, <laughs> to get through Reaper's atmosphere. Um, so we're sort of compensating by bringing along three atmospheric probes and each of them has uh, have three heat shields each. So yeah, they're only 1.25 meters wide but each of them have got three 2.5 meter heat shields. That should be more than enough to get them through the atmosphere of Reaper and a number of uh, parachutes as well. They do also have some thrusters if they need to slow down, but I'm thinking the atmosphere of Reaper is thick enough they should be able to land on parachutes alone. Uh, that is the hope anyway. You can see those three atmospheric probes just at the bottom there. And right at the top we have the final lander of this mission. It is called the Severo lander. If you've read Red Rising you'll know that's quite appropriate since it's quite a, quite a short and stubby lander. Uh, and it only has just about enough Delta V to land on Valm 
and take off again with a full load of ore. So it's pretty much useless for any of the other moons around Reaper. That's its only purpose, is to land on Val, mine the surface, and you'll see that most of its volume is taken up by ore tanks. Valm has got very low gravity, so it's pretty much perfect for mining uh, ore and taking it back up to Morningstar to be refined. You'll notice that the uh, the ISR U to try and save weight on this actual lander itself, uh, so that we can just carry the maximum amount of ore. Um, we actually don't have an ISR U on the lander. It's going to land, mine up a bunch of ore, go back to Morningstar, and then we're going to process all of the fuel back on Morningstar, and then we'll send it back to the surface and just keep doing. It. I don't know how many times we're going to have to do that uh, in order to actually uh, refuel the entire spacecraft. We won't need to refuel Morningstar entirely to get it back. To be fair, as I said before, we could probably do this without any refueling. I just, I don't want to risk it. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure um, how much Delta V we're going to need to go and explore all the various different moons. I don't want to have to worry about it, basically, or make this mission, you know, even bigger than it already is to, uh, yeah, and I don't want to have to cut out any of the landers. You know, I wanted to do all the various different things and just not have to worry about fuel. So um, we have the mining lander, um, we're going to need a separate lander for Valm anyway, probably. So we might as well stick some drills on it um, and just an ISRU on Morningstar. So we just don't have to be concerned about our fuel situation. So you can see here where we're doing our final approach to Morningstar. Our frame rate at this point is getting a little painfully slow. So I've sped up all the footage even more than four times. So it looks like it's four times speed, but uh, it's more like six times speed at this point. Uh, to try and smooth the frames out a little bit. But uh, without any problems, we managed to dock. And you see, since we had a bit of spare payload capacity, I brought up a bunch of extra mono propellant. So we're just almost refueling uh, all of those tanks, though we've uh, got a little bit left, but uh, it's not the end of the world. We have more than enough mono propellant to get us out to Reaper. Once we're there, we can use the Severo Lander to refuel our spacecraft in its entirety. So, now we are fully ready to head out to Reaper. However, we've got one little bit of uh, housekeeping we need to do first. The engines on the Mustang Cargo SSTO are overheating for some reason. Uh, they're just having problems dissipating heat. Um, I think it's just the heat that they accumulated during uh, the ascent up to Morningstar. For some reason, the engines are still hot. Uh, I don't entirely know why, but we didn't slap any radiators on this spacecraft, so it doesn't actually have any way of e efficiently getting rid of the heat. Uh, but thankfully, we packed a bunch of um, crates with a bunch of different supplies, just in case we needed them. So we've got spare parachutes, solar panels, and of course, we have a bunch of spare radiators as well. So we're just getting out our lone uh, flight engineer on this mission, Tibin Kerman, and just getting out and attaching some radiators, just so we can dissipate the heat from those uh, Sabre engines. We can't have them overheating and melting while we're in orbit. That would be a little bit unfortunate. And then once we've attached those, I just thought I'd give uh, a little bit of a tour of the spacecraft so we can see it in all of its glory. That, uh, that giant radiator there. As I said, it's sort of doubling as a radiator and also as a radiation shield because we are using uh, nuclear engines and you never know. You know. It's better safe than sorry. Might as well shield the uh, the crew from any kind of uh, dangerous isotopes. We did try and fly through the uh, habitation ring there for a second time. It kind of bumped Tibbin's head accidentally, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so not, not particularly graceful. Note to self, don't try and f <laughs> fly through the habitation ring it's rotating a little bit too quickly uh, for that to be uh, an easy task but uh, there you go we've had a wonderful little tour of all the various different modules you can see the uh, cryonic freezing chamber just there below the command pod and uh, we're going to be using that very shortly but first we are going to transmit the remaining science from our science labs that they are going to be uh, researching those reports and the like for a few more hundred days. And now we are ready for our burn out to Reaper. It's going to be a roughly 10 minute burn. And since we actually have these big, powerful nu nuclear engines, we can actually do this in one burn. It would have been more efficient to do it in two, but yeah, I mean, the main reason for strapping this much fuel on this thing and having a refueling lander, so I don't really have to worry about Delta V. Uh, I just <laughs> basically just want to get out there and make these burns as 
painless as possible. So doing it all in one massive burn, which as I said, yes, not quite as efficient as, uh, as doing it in a couple of different burns at uh, making sure we're close as possible to our periapsis. But uh, yeah, I couldn't really be bothered with doing multiple passes. So we're just doing it in one great big burn, which did take quite a while, even though we are now on eight times speed and then in three times physics warp in game, the frame rate was pretty low. So uh, I did have to go and listen to a bit of music <laughs> and do some uh, different things while we were waiting for this to go. But I thought I'd get some pretty nice shots of Morningstar in the meantime. A little irritating that when you're heading into the outer solar system, you've got to burn on the night side of the planet. So we can't really see Morningstar in all of its glory, uh, but you can see it partially illuminated by the uh, the engine plumes there. Although the crew themselves won't be able to see those uh, engine plumes because of the giant radiation shield. So the mission is going to arrive in about three years' time. So once we've uh, finished researching all the reports and the like, the entire crew will go into uh, cryonic stasis, uh, so we don't use up too many supplies for the journey out there. In the meantime, of course, uh, we're going to be continuing to work on Artemis and we're going to launch our interstellar probe, the Endurance, uh, once we've set up our beamed power network all around. So we've got quite a few things to do uh, and this spacecraft is almost certainly going to arrive at Reaper in the follow-up series. So it's not going to arrive um, for quite some time. It's not going to arrive in this series anyway. It's going to arrive uh, in the next series which will be it's in the same save as this one uh, but with a slightly different focus. So this series endurance is going to end after we've launched our interstellar probe uh, to Valentine. And uh, yeah, but that's going to happen, as I said, before this spacecraft reaches Reaper. But uh, before then, what we're going to do is we're going to freeze all our non-essential personnel. We need to keep our six scientists uh, researching away, but there's no point having our two pilots, Ted and Katrina, uh, and our engineer actually um, still conscious. So we might as well just freeze them. I say two pilots, um, two pilots, one scientist and an engineer. We've got one field scientist, so we've got six of our top trained scientists, our most experienced scientists in the science labs, uh, researching away. And then we've got one scientist uh, who's not quite as experienced, I think level two, is going to head down to the surface um, to, of the different moons uh, so that we can keep all six scientists researching away, but also have a scientist on uh, missions as well. So those four crew members are now frozen and we can see here we've reduced our life support usage. Um, and once we finish researching those reports, the six scientists on our main research crew will follow suit. But that will be in a future episode. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I do hope you have enjoyed. Morningstar is on its way and I will see you all next time.